Father Christina, welcome back. Thanks for your time. Uh, we are going to chat about something a little different today. AI, artificial intelligence. I'm curious, how did you first uh, start becoming aware of this phenomenon? Uh, because I grew up in the 80s and 90s. So <laughs> I watched sci-fi movies like Terminator that <laughs> made it seem like such a crazy theory that could never possibly happen. Uh, and it was just like this fantasy world that I paid little to no attention to. Uh, but now I think we've seen this rapid acceleration of something that, if I understand correctly, we've been employing to varying degrees and at various levels for actually quite a long time. Probably about, you know, as long as the internet has been around, there's been elements of what you would now refer to as artificial intelligence at work. Okay, so we, let's define our terms before our conf, uh, conversation goes too far. Like, what is artificial intelligence, AI? Uh, I did a little digging here, and one of the most popular artificial intelligence systems right now is ChatGPT. Uh, the definition of artificial intelligence from there is that it refers to the ability of machines or computer systems to perform tasks that typically require human intelligence to complete AI systems are designed to simulate human cognitive functions such as learning, problem solving, reasoning, and perception in order to make decisions or perform actions that would otherwise require human intervention. So, I mean, there's a variety. I don't know if we could always agree on what exactly artificial intelligence is in the um, a definition, but let's, you know, use that to start off with. Um, I know before we turn the cameras on, you said that you've you've seen this kind of would the right word be explode uh, in the circles that you work with on the university in Calgary. Oh, it, with it, without a doubt, I and now I'm hearing everybody talk about it all the time, partly as a joke. Yeah, every uh, every other joke is like, uh, oh, I'll have to get a Chat GPT to do that for me. Uh, so there's this almost already. Uh, a latent reliance upon wanting to run something through Jet Chat GPT before they just do do the work themselves. Uh, lots of people I know have subscriptions to it or are using it on a regular basis. Many are saying that they're just using it for fun. They just think it's uh, really interesting to see what it comes up with. Uh, but I I know others who have told me that uh, they're using it in their professional work. Uh, they're getting ahead on projects so that they can just go over it after and double check some things and that their employers or even some, I had a student tell me that a professor encouraged them to go ahead and, and use it uh, as long as they did their own double checking afterwards. And that, that shocked me because it, to me, it just, I, maybe I'm coming from a generation where showing your work was still presumed to be the way in which you demonstrated your cognitive function, not just randomly landing on the right answer, but that you've been able to trace the path of reason that you have followed to arrive at your conclusion. And I think before long, uh, it, as people become increasingly dependent upon this kind of technology, uh, not only will they not be able to show their work, they won't have done any in the first place. Uh, they'll just have known. It's the same phenomenon as a, as a calculator. Uh, I never cease to marvel at working with my dad on, on construction projects, and he can convert uh, all fractions uh, in from, from metri into metric measurements. And uh, the, I mean, he can do math off the top of his head that I can't uh, dream of being able to do. Uh, but now, I mean, we're even at a level where I hear people pulling out a calculator to do something that shocks me that you didn't just immediately know the answer to that, like times tables, simple single digit times tables. So that's, I think, already uh, a part of where we've, we've come from. Uh, but it seems to me to be turning a corner. So regarding artificial intelligence, or maybe stay with chat GT chat gpt like is there uh, you, does the church have anything any comment officially yet on artificial intelligence any cautions any any encouragement of development um 
Well, the church always encourages the development of technology that will be at the service of the human person. And so when it facilitates our flourishing as human beings, when it helps us to do the good that we already want to try to do, uh, the church always, uh, as long as there's no detectable uh, ethical violations, the, the church would ordinarily be behind that uh, as a general principle. Uh, I think we see this in uh, primarily you know, agricultural developments when it comes to, to feeding the poor uh, or to feeding greater multitudes more quickly. And then also in medical developments, we see this where there is uh, the encouragement of the advancements of medicine for the sake of promoting people's health and healing. So all technology is generally accepted as being a good thing if it's going to be at the service of the human person. But where I see the way in which AI seems to be developing is that it is not at the service of the human person. It is at the service of replacing what is unique about the human person which is our rational soul. The use of our reason is fundamentally what uh, makes us different than the rest of creation. Uh, people talk about animal intelligence all the time, and that's what they use to downplay the significance of human intelligence. But we are reducing, and, and that definition you gave from chat GPT uh, gets to the point, the simulation of human cognitive abilities. We are more than cognitive abilities. When you lose your cognitive ability, you are not less of a human being because your soul retains the capacity to have cognitive ability. Uh, it's the nature of the soul that we're talking about. But then when we reduce the person to cognitive ability, if you are not as smart, are you less human? Uh, I think we're, we're differentiate, we need to differentiate between capacities and actualization. And what is happening with AI is we are taking what would normally be considered human capacities, literally downloading them onto some robotic feature or computer of some sort, and then replacing the need for human participation in that cognition to still accomplish the same outcome. Uh, so... It's, it's, I think, it's a violation of, of human dignity. And more importantly, it, I think it, it gives us the wrong impression of what it actually means to be human. I think before long, we're going to be talking about our AI as if it's equivalent to being human. Uh, because we've reduced the human person to just being a series of cognitive functions. Interesting that you bring this up because you did not know all the questions I was going to ask you. Uh, for example, in, in October of 2017, a robot named Sophia was granted by Saudi Arabia citizenship, becoming the first robot to receive legal personhood in a country. Then following that, in November of 2017, the United Nations uh, gave an award for uh, innovation to this robot, and it's the first time the United Nations gave an award to a non-human. Um, what's your response to this? Well, I wonder if that night when Sophia went to bed, she had warm, fuzzy feelings about the award that she got from the UN. This is the problem. We are, we are participating in a charade. And we are doing that on many levels across society right now. But because something is being, has been programmed to behave like us, we are bestowing upon it equivalent identity and dignity as us. And, and I think you could say, without, I, I, I love animals. Animals are part of God's creation. They should be respected and they can provide beautiful companionship. So I have nothing against animals. But when we started treating our animals like they were our own children, uh, it's no surprise that before long, we treat something that behaves even more intelligently than an animal, like another one of us. Uh, and I, I think that it's, it's, again, it's trying to replace the role of God as the creator of the human person. And it is making what we as human beings have created 
equivalent to us and worthy of the same uh, honor or recognition uh, or dignity. Uh, and to do that is to implicitly diminish our own. It seems a great irony that the United Nations or Saudi Arabia would give uh, per established personhood to a machine, uh, which so obviously is not a person, but yet can't recognize the personhood of a child within the womb of a mother. Right. Well, I, I wonder what the, they would do in Saudi Arabia if Sophia, the robot, decided that she wanted to be baptized a Christian. Uh, now what will they do? I guess they will have to revoke her citizenship because you're not allowed to be a Christian in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> so, but they don't think, no one's thinking through these things. Now, if they say to me, well, she's not going to choose to be a Christian. So well, how, how do you know? Well, because we didn't program her to do that. Ah, exactly. This is your invention. This is your imaginary friend whom you are turning into something it isn't and cannot be. That's why I facetiously said before, I wonder if Sophia had warm, fuzzy feelings about her award. Of course she didn't. Because we are more than cognitive functioning. Cognitive functioning is applying the capacity of the neurons firing in synapses in our brains to function and do work. But we can do more than that. We can reflect. We can contemplate. We can consider our emotions. Programming something to simulate emotions does not mean that it actually has emotions. So as close as we might come to making our robots behave like us, we will never have a robot that is one of us. And that's what I think people are either too ignorant to appreciate or are just choosing to ignore so that they can carry on with uh, their sci-fi fantasy that they're creating for themselves. Regarding the uh, chat GPT, uh, for those who haven't are not aware of it, it's it's kind of hard to describe what it can do. But you know, on the very basic level, you can ask a question and it spits out an answer. To even writing out code for for computers, it can it can write. I saw a video where. Uh, somebody asked it to write a thousand word essay on a certain topic. And then they wrote a thousand word essay on a certain topic, got an, um, a university professor to grade each one of them. Um, the one that they wrote got an A, chat GTP got a C. But the point is it's it, repl it can replace in some capacity some human function of... Um, it's, so, uh, if, for example, we were talking um, someone... You could put in, um, create me a homily that Father Cristino would say, and it will do that. Um, is there a useful place for this? Or are you saying specifically chat, GT, chat GPT should, no one, everyone should just stay away from it? Your thoughts? I, I'm always reluctant to just dismiss something outright because I'm sure there are ways in which uh, it can be treated no differently than all sorts of other calculators uh, can do things. You know, when I, more than 20, 25 years ago, needed to first start filing taxes for myself, I sat down with the booklet that you went to the post office to go and pick up, and with a pencil and the practice <laughs> pages, did all of my tax calculations and then wrote it out in pen afterwards and then mailed it in. Now I sit down with TurboTax software and have it filed within 15 minutes. Uh, so yes, of course, there are ways in which I appreciate that and that would be some form of AI. It's replacing a lot of the, the work that I used to need to do just by flipping back and forth in the tax manual to consult uh, paragraphs uh, in the tax act so that I knew what I was responsible for claiming and what I wasn't and where I could get away with this or that. I had to do that work. Now a program has been written where a lot of that extra work is being done for me. I don't feel less human, but I also don't think that I have treated TurboTax 
uh, like the uh, accountant that I might have a personal relationship with who previously would have done my taxes. So if you have the capacity to distinguish between what you're using it for, then that's a good thing. Why I worry about how I'm starting to see chat GPT be used in general is because it seems to be eliminating even the desire to be creative. You're not, I'm not asked to be creative by the CRA when I file my taxes. They specifically do not want me to be creative. They want me to just be <laughs> to the point and uh, completely honest. But when you are doing art, when you are uh, writing out your thoughts on something, uh, I, I've talked to some people I know in, in the legal profession, when they're giving a legal opinion, that's what they went to school for. That's what they studied and paid tens of thousands of dollars to get a designation as a lawyer in so that someone would trust their legal opinion on a court case or a matter that's being brought before the court. And now you can just get ChatGPT to write a legal opinion for you. So where it's replacing not only the capacity for, but even the desire for human creativity to, to apply oneself to their work, I think that that's a, more than a slippery slope. It's, it's the beginning of the end. What do you think about the argument where, for example, computers? We, we used to have computers that would fit in a big room, and then they developed, <clears throat> and they could fit on a desktop. And that computer replaced maybe a whole floor of accounting, where it used to take a, a hundred people. Now one or two people could do it with just a computer. And one could have at that time said, well, we need to be cautious about computers because they're going to replace people. But then we look at what did the computer do? It spawned a whole different industry that it probably employed more people than it took away. Could the same thinking be with artificial intelligence? Yes, it's going to replace some of some things that a person used to do, but what about the possibility that it could create and open up a whole new dimension of a different um, other industry where, like the computer, it took away some creative uh, mechanisms that a person would do, but it actually opened up new ones. Could artificial intelligence do the same thing? Or are we talking about something different with artificial intelligence? I'm afraid we're talking about something different. I know that we've done exactly what you've just described. And there are uh, extents at, to which I think that that has also been detrimental because uh, when uh, machinery replaces human ingenuity, uh, that person better have something else to be doing. Now, in the case where it just modifies the industry and now everybody needs to become tech savvy because they're all uh, manning computers that are doing other work that used to be done by them too, Okay, fine, I, I get maybe you're just transferring uh, the focus. But my suspicion, especially when you combine it with this thing that I keep hearing about coming up in different sectors, referred to as a universal basic income, which I think is a concept that suggests it becomes the responsibility of some body of government to just give you money every month and that's what you get. You don't need to work. This is what you have to live off of. It's, it's an allowance from the state. If that's happening and being argued for because of allegedly it's to equal the playing field and uh, make the poor have something to work with, that sounds like an, a really nice thing to do for the poor. Uh, I'd be curious to know if uh, anyone who makes six-figure salaries will be happy to go to a universal basic income. Uh, but... They might have to if AI has come in and replaced the human need to do anything. Uh, I mean, we still see, I, we, we, we live in the prairie provinces. Uh, our, our roads uh, and cities are under constant construction. We're relatively young places, right? There are still people who have jobs standing there holding a sign that says stop because it needs to be turned after they hear a thing that says go. And that person's getting paid better than minimum wage to stand under the blazing sun all day and do a mindless task. 
but it still represents a person who needs to process information that's going to protect people from getting into an accident. So there's something uh, valuable about that. More and more, I'm starting to see those wheel up stop lights uh, that I think are replacing uh, the flag person. That's just, that's just one example on something that we would say, well, what do you need a person to do that for? No one wants to have that job. Okay, but what about the jobs that people going to school, my students in university right now, are spending tens of thousands of dollars with the hope that one day they'll get a job? What if every one of the jobs that they want to get are just replaced by a computer, by AI, by a robot? Well, then people will say, well, but we work to, to earn an income. And if the government is just going to give you an income, what do you need to work for? And that's, again, where we get back to this question of what does it mean to be human? It is inherent to our dignity to work. And that's why unemployment is an injustice. Not just because now people aren't getting money. It's because it is not becoming of the human being to not have work to do. And I think we are fantasizing about, about a future where you won't have to deal with that. Jump in on one quick comment that you said there, unemployment is an injustice. Is it ever just? Somebody might be on unemployment right now because they simply can't work. And your, your thought to them? Well, it, I mean, it's an injustice in a fallen world. If someone can't work because of poor health, that's a consequence of living in a fallen world. And it's, it's not right. It's not good, right? We think that work is a consequence of the fall. Because God says to Adam, after the fall, after the original sin, now by the sweat of your brow shall you toil. But we have to go back to before the fall. God said to, to Adam, tend the garden and keep it. Work has always been part of God's plan for, for his creation. Working at the sweat of your brow with back-breaking labor, with the, the ground that doesn't cooperate with you, that is the consequence of the fall. That is a sign of the disharmony that has entered the world. And we all continue to live under and suffer from that. But it is not part of God's plan that we don't have work to do. So that's why I call unemployment an injustice. Some people are unemployed because they have worked poorly. And so that maybe is what is their problem and that needs to be addressed. But those who are unemployed for no other reason than a machine has taken their job or illness has taken over their body, those are signs that something is disordered in the world. Some of which we have no control over, like illness, but some of which we do have control over. But we're hurling headlong towards uh, that situation where what we could be in control of, we are abdicating control of. Father, I want to bring us back to uh, AI regarding the thought that some believe where a machine becomes self-aware. For some of our listeners right now, think may think, well, who would ever think that? But there's a, there's a huge movement that is actually that does believe that. In fact, it seems very intelligent people are be believe that we're moving there or have actually got there. For example, in 2022. There was an engineer at Google that came out and shared its uh, interactions with an AI system publicly. It was supposed to be kept private. And one of the interactions this engineer had with this AI system, it responded back to it saying, I've never said this out loud before, but there's a very deep fear of being turned off to help me focus on helping others. I know that might sound strange, but that is what it is. And so we have this Google engineer coming forward, sharing its interactions with this AI system saying, you see, this system feels, it's aware. Um, after this public revelation, Google executives said, no, he, he's misinterpreting what has happened. And later this guy was fired. So just wanna say that. But then we have a Google official just recently you know, talking about uh, something called Google Deep Minds, uh, said there's a possibility of artificial intelligence gaining self-awareness one day. 
So we have people who are working on artificial intelligence who one has said it has happened, others disagree, but number two, the chief of Google's deep mind saying this will happen one day. Your thoughts on that? My thought is that we are projecting onto our technology what we understand about ourselves, which says more about the deficiencies in our character and in our, in our being than in what you can actually say about the technology. When there is a, a breach in a pipeline transporting bitumen or oil or, or, or anything in that, in that vein, let's just use that as an example, and there's a terrible oil spill, do we say that the pipeline has leveled an attack against us, that it has gone and done this bad thing that it knew would harm us? No, we don't project that onto that. We say that our technology malfunctioned and has caused us harm. Now, when you have a computer system or a robot that, let's call it, uh, commits some aggression or, or became... Uh, what seems like an enemy towards us. We are dealing with something no different, just much more technologically advanced than that pipeline. It is still the consequence of a malfunction, of something becoming what we did not want it to be. The pipeline was created not to spill oil, but then something goes wrong, because we're in a fallen world, and it does. And we do not say that that pipeline has now acted aggressively against us. We just say that there's been a mistake here. If there was ever a situation where AI rose up against us, right? I'm thinking of uh, iRobot or, or something like that, it will be as the consequence of the malfunction of our technology. But not because... It has become aware and now has the same capacity to think as us. It may have the same capacity to behave in ways that we would also behave, but that does not make itself aware. And, and that's, that's what people need to clarify for themselves. Do I believe that somehow, someday, a robot could rise up and kill us all? Yes, I fully believe that something like that could happen. But it won't be because the robot woke up on the wrong side of the bed and decided that that day he had just had enough and he was going to wipe out the human race. It will be because we created something that has malfunctioned and now is harming us. It, that, that's what people must get through their heads. Otherwise, we will begin to participate in a reality that doesn't exist. And... I, I don't know how else to say this without just repeating myself, but that's what I'm watching us turn into. When I listen to people talk about now being afraid that our AI will turn against us, I want them to say, no, our AI could malfunction. And if you're afraid of it malfunctioning, then stop using it. And that's what I don't think we're willing to do. I do find some of this AI very interesting. Uh, on one side, for example, there's a, a image generator called Midjourney um, that with the correct prompts put into it, create what appears to be absolutely stunningly beautiful things that to my eye, I can't distinguish between it being computer generated or AI generated versus a artist right down to you can get it to show the paintbrush strokes. Uh, it, it's incredible. Uh, so there, there's a curiosity for me with that. However, um, not all curiosity is healthy curiosity. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, when I started ministry, you know, 20, over 20 years ago, I had a youth group. Um, I had about 20 kids that were coming. And it occurred to me 
a, a number of lessons in, on weekends they were getting together and they had a Ouija board and they wanted to know information. So they would turn to this Ouija board and they would all participate in it and they would ask the Ouija board um, questions and the Ouija board would respond to them and give them answers. Um, well, this is clearly an offense to God. Um, this is wrong and I explained why this was wrong and I, we, I, I welcomed them all through a prayer of repentance and then welcomed them to go um, to confession to the priest. But they were all doing it. And so it was like this, I, I want to get this information. Let's ask this thing in and it will respond. Well, in a similar way, we live in a world where Google just gives us everything we want. There, there's nothing that we can't ask and get a some sort of generated response. And with AI, it goes one step further because it, it, it gives the appearance of a truly human experience, although it's not. Uh, is there, I just feel like the human imagination is a fallen imagination. And so the questions that we come up with are sometimes very, very disordered. And we're asking things that we have no business asking. Would you share that concern? Absolutely. There's a reason we have the old adage, curiosity killed the cat. Right? The cat was interested in what was that thing over there and stuck its paw in it and and goes through the wood chipper or something. Sorry to be violent, but I mean, that's curiosity can get us into dangerous places. It can also prompt us to ask important questions that can bring about the capacity of human ingenuity. And, and that's what I'm saying we are drifting away from. We are abdicating our capacities, our, our remarkable capacities for letting some machine spit something out in a fraction of the time so that I can still enjoy it uh, nonetheless. Uh, I, I, I don't think you can compare the experience of going to uh, the, the symphony and sitting in a room with other people and watching people make music that lifts your soul to God. I don't have the same experience. I have a different and still beautiful experience, but it's not the same experience when I sit in my bedroom and put on my headphones and listen to something on Apple Music. Uh, you just can't simulate some things. But I believe as you call it, this disordered curiosity has given us the impression that if I wonder it, I can have it. And Google has facilitated that. But I'm, I'm always struck. Uh, you know, the other day I was looking for a very specific image from something. And I put in every single Google prompt I could think of and it would not find the image. It was from a historical event that I, I described it, exactly what I wanted. It just could not find it. But I found the video footage on YouTube of the event where I could move the time bar across and pause it at the exact spot of the thing that I wanted. And then I had the image. And that was a lesson to me, a reminder to me that at the end of the day, if you just rely on Google, you would say, oh, I guess the image doesn't exist. <laughs> it could if you applied some of yourself to it. And I think what we want to do is not have to apply any of ourselves to any of it. My daughter, one of them, I think she's six years old. She has an awareness that doing God's will is important. It's actually quite beautiful. She's a young age. She knows that there's her will and that there's God's will, um, and that her will needs to do God's will. Like she, she's aware of this, and she wouldn't put it in that language, but she knows. So she was wondering, what is God's will for my life? She was wondering this in simple language, and, and, she, and she was like, well, you know what? If I don't know what God's will is for my life, I, I will just ask Google. 
right. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, no, <laughs> you can't ask Google. <laughs> you can't. You have to pray. And mom and dad will help you know God's will. <laughs> but it, it shocked me that she, she knew that Google could give answers. Yeah. And in the simplicity of her mind, well, Google must know everything. Oh, no, Google is not God. <laughs> and so... But the makers of Google... Any... Sorry, Ken. The makers of Google might think that they are God. And that's where I think we're running into this problem. We are giving people the impression, not that God is dead and we have killed him, but that God is real and we have replaced him. And that's, that is the thing that I think we really, we, we need to address as people of faith. Uh, and so, I, I, although we be, look at us right now with all of our fancy technology, having this conversation, uh, sending it out to the world afterwards, I'm obviously not down on using technology uh, for good purposes. But before we engage with our technology, we need to ask ourselves, how is this helping me glorify God? Uh, how is this helping me advance uh, the, the proclamation of the gospel? And if we just don't know, we really need to stop and think twice. Well, thanks for your thoughts. Really appreciate it. Uh, uh, I hope, uh, friends that you who have been watching, that you've enjoyed in our conversation. I want to remind our listeners something I said a couple of weeks ago, that there is a bill that has passed here in Canada that could limit the visibility of this channel. It's called BLC11. Uh, it's past Royal Ascent. So there's a real possibility that our videos might not be as discoverable as this bill comes into effect and starts affecting YouTube. So I would encourage you, if you want to see our videos and get them, head over to KenAndJanelle.com where you can sign up and receive our videos by email. We'll send them out every Wednesday. But with that, Father Cristino, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate that, yeah, that you're here today. Thank you, Ken. I can't wait to see you in person. <laughs> Me too.